making sure the recording. Okay, so let's present this. All right, so we are in chapter five, and I'm going to cover the first section and the first half of the second section. Um, we're talking about principles of bonding and types of bonds today. The objectives of this lesson, first, what is a chemical bond? Why do chemical bonds form? Are molecules always made from more than one element? What determines how atoms bond? Are the properties of compounds the same as those of the elements of which they are made? How does the role of electrons differ in covalent, ionic, and metallic bonding? <clears throat> What's an easy way to illustrate compounds? And can two atoms form more than one bond between them? A lot of material to cover. So first we have, um, if you are filling in this worksheet, um, we are starting right here. Why do bonds form? Okay. All right, so here we have a Bohr model of argon. Argon is a noble gas, so it has a full outer energy level, full outer shell, which means it has eight, because the maximum number of electrons in any shell except the first one is eight. The first one can only have two electrons. So atoms bond because they become more stable when they have full outer shells. Okay, everybody wants to be just like the noble gases. The noble gases are stable just how they are. They don't want to interact with any other elements. They are happy being single. Whereas all of the other elements are unstable and they need to form relationships with one another to become stable. So elements and atoms can become stable by donating, receiving, or sharing electrons. And that allows them to achieve stability. And this is the octet rule, which means all atoms are trying to get to that eight electron sh outer shell stability. That's like the epitome of stability. So everyone is trying to get to eight electrons in the outer shell, whether they're giving up electrons in, that are in excess, or they can receive electrons in order to, to get eight, or they can just share them. All right, we'll talk about the different types of bonding. So an ion, we've discussed ions before. Um, atoms in their normal state are electrically neutral, where they have the same amount of protons and electrons. So if you have an element like beryllium, which has an atomic number of four, that tells me it has four protons. And because it's electrically neutral on its own, that also tells me it has four electrons. This looks like it is, what is number three? Is that, hmm, I don't remember. But this element, number three, atomic number three, has three protons, three electrons, and it looks like three neutrons. Is, well, four neutrons, so this is some sort of isotope. Anyways. <clears throat> so an ion is an atom that has lost or gained an electron. All right, so we've got sodium here, the Bohr model of sodium, where we can see that um, sodium has one electron in its outer energy level outer energy level or outer shell, and this is also called a valence electron. It's in group one, so we can also look in group one and say these elements have one valence electron, any element that's in that first column. So sodium has one valence electron. To become an ion, it can lose this electron because then it will get to stability because then this outer energy level will basically disappear and will be left with this energy level, which is full of electrons. So if it loses an electron, it's losing a negative charge. So if you subtract something that's negative, if you subtract minus one, then it's actually kind of like adding. So subtracting a negative equals adding. So you're getting a positive charge. So now since it's lost a negative charge, it's become positive because it was at a zero, a net zero electrical charge before when it had this electron, but now the electron is gone, so it actually has a positive charge now. It's called a cation. Cation is an ion with a positive charge. It's also the cutest ion ever. The opposite of a cation is an anion, which has a negative net charge. So ionic bonding occurs when a metal atom, so any element that is to the left of the metalloid stair step, 
if a metal atom donates one or more electrons to a nonmetal atom. So this is only talking about the bonds between metal and nonmetal elements. So the metal will always become the cation. It will always become positive because of the losing electrons. It's donating them. And the nonmetal will always gain the electrons. So it's gaining a negative charge and becoming negative or an anion. <coughs> For instance, we have sodium, which is a metal, and it has one outer electron, which is also known as a valence electron. And we also have chlorine. Chlorine is a halogen, and it has seven outer electrons, or valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, as you can see, the chlorine needs one electron to get to stability to have eight valence electrons. And the sodium wants to get rid of this extra one. Right? So neither atom is happy right now because neither atom is stable. So to become stable, sodium will donate its outer electron to the chlorine atom. Just like that. So now this has lost a negative charge and become positive, and the chlorine has gained a negative charge and become negative, which is also called an anion. So now the atoms have opposite charges. This one has a net positive charge, and this one has a net negative charge, and they are attracting to each other. So not only have they achieved stability, but they are now attracted to each other, and they form the ionic bond. They're both happy. Covalent bonding is a different type of bonding, and that occurs between nonmetal elements. So this is when atoms share pairs of electrons instead of giving and receiving. So the pair is included in the outer shell of both atoms. Covalent bonding occurs between atoms of nonmetals only. So ionic is between metal and nonmetal, whereas covalent is between nonmetals and nonmetals. Nitrogen, which is a nonmetal, has five valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, which means in order to reach stability, it needs to gain three. All right, it has space for three electrons here. All right. So if we bring in hydrogen, hydrogen has one valence electron and is able to bond to share its electron with nitrogen. So three hydrogens come in to share their one valence electron each in order to achieve stability. So now the nitrogen is sharing one uh, electron with hydrogen over here whereas the hydrogen is sharing its electron with nitrogen, and that forms a covalent bond. And the same thing is here. This electron is being shared with hydrogen, and the hydrogen's electron is being shared with the nitrogen. And this is a covalent bond, as well as this covalent bond. Whereas these two electrons are a lone pair. Right? So we have the bonded electron pair, and we have the lone electron pair. This is called a covalent bond. If we go back to our dot notation, our electron dot notation, we're going to expand on that a little bit and learn about Lewis dot structures. So the same element, if we go back, nitrogen with three hydrogens, nitrogen with three hydrogens, we're going to represent this in a different way. So a Lewis structure is a system for modeling the covalent bonds, so this structure is only used in covalent bonds. We don't use this to document metallic or ionic bonds. So this is only to show the bonds between um, uh, covalently bonded molecules, like NH3. So we've got the nitrogen with its lone pair of electrons, and then we also have the three hydrogens that have formed a single covalent bond with the nitrogen. Each of those, um, this red line right here is representing a covalent bond, a single covalent bond. So this is telling me that nitrogen is donating one electron per each of these bonds, right? So nitrogen, I'm sorry, not donating, but sharing. So nitrogen is sharing three electrons with three hydrogens. The hydrogens are sharing one electron apiece, okay? And this forms a single bond. We have the lone pair and then the bonded pair. <clears throat> this also occurs between atoms that are the same. So oxygen can bond with itself. Oxygen has space for two electrons in its outer energy level because it has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
So it has space for two. So if another oxygen atom comes in and forms O2, this oxygen has two to donate to the, the center pot as well. So now these oxygens are sharing four electrons together. All right. So instead of just donating one apiece, they've each donated two to the pot to share between the two of them. And this becomes a double bond. All right, this is how we represent a double bond. We just use two red lines. So all this tells me is that each oxygen is sharing two of its electrons. Okay. Oxygen in this example is called diatomic oxygen, uh, which basically means if you break this word down, di is the Latin root word for two, and then atomic is uh, representing atoms. So it basically just means that it's a molecule that's made up of two atoms. Nitrogen in its diatomic state uh, actually shares three electrons each because nitrogen has five valence electrons because it's in the fifth, uh, not the fifth period, or not the fifth group, but the fifth uh, valence electron column. So each of those nitrogens is sharing three of its electrons to the center pot right here, and it forms three bonds, so a triple bond. So diatomic nitrogen shares three valence electrons resulting in a triple covalent bond. These are elements that exist naturally in a diatomic state. So H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, they are found out in the wild in a naturally diatomic state. So we will hardly ever find iodine by itself. Okay, We'll hardly ever find bromine by itself. It'll almost always exist as bromine too. Okay? <clears throat> Here's another example of a covalent bond. So we know, already know that oxygen has space for two electrons in its outer shell. So if we have two hydrogen atoms that come in, they each have one electron to share, one there and one there, and this forms H2O, or water. So we have the lone pair, and then we have two bonded pairs. This is how we would use a Lewis structure to represent water, with each of these having a single bond between the hydrogen and oxygen. So in this example, water is polyatomic, which basically means it's a molecule made up of different kinds of atoms. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. At first, it wasn't hiding in this thing. So then when I got to move to this, I like, really, I kept um, coughing and um, spelling. Okay. All right, so the third type of bonding that we have is metallic bonding. Metallic bonding occurs when atoms of metals, so only metals bonding with other metals, when they give up electrons that form an electron C. And then those positively charged atoms, the metals that have given up electrons that have become cations, they are bonded through their electrical attraction to the negatively charged electrons. So hopefully this next graphic will help you understand that. So here we have all these metals, these metal atoms that have given up their free electrons, those electrons that are in the outer energy level, <clears throat> like sodium, for example, would give up one electron into this electron C. So each of those, because they've given up a negative charge, have become positive cations. So we've got this electron C, all these electrons kind of floating around and because of the law of electrostatic charges, these atoms are electrically attracted to the electrons that are floating around, and it brings all of them kind of closer together, and it creates what's called a metallic bond. So we have these free electrons that are electrically attracted to the positive metal cations. That is a metallic bond. Here is a fun graphic to further explain. So here we have an ionic bond where the metal atom is gifting one of its electrons to the nonmetal atom. And we also have a covalent bond where these two nonmetal atoms 
are sharing electrons with each other. And then we have a metallic bond where we have one metal that is, it looks like it's trying to hit its electron out into the C so that other metals can be electrically attracted to it. Here is a table describing the characteristics of ionic covalent and metallic bonds. So the key takeaway here is that in an ionic bond, electrons are transferred. They are either gained or lost. So metals will lose their electrons, whereas nonmetals will gain them. Covalent bonds, the electrons are shared between the two nonmetals. And then in a metallic bond, uh, the nonmetals will freely give up their extra electrons and float they will float around in like an electron C. So in an ionic bond, this is between a metal and a nonmetal. In covalent, it's only between nonmetals. And then a metallic bond is only between metals. These are um, things that we might not really cover in this class, uh, but just kind of a main takeaway. This is what the final product will look like, the state that it will be in. Um, this is the conductivity after the ionic bond has been formed, um, the melting point after the bonds have been formed. And here are some examples. So an example of a covalent bond would be sodium chloride, magnesium oxide. Covalent bond examples would be water, diatomic oxygen, carbon dioxide, and then all of these metals like copper, aluminum, and gold would metallically um, bond by giving up their free electrons into the electron C and being electrostatically attracted to, it, to each other. <clears throat> All right, so on this worksheet, we have this section that says you try. All right, so the first question is, what is the most important factor affecting how atoms form chemical bonds? Well, the answer is how many valence electrons they have, because that determines how many electrons they can either give away if they have any spare electrons, or if they just need one or two to reach that, that pinnacle of eight electrons that to finish the octet rule. Um, atoms of which elements tend to gain electrons? Well, nonmetals tend to gain electrons in an ionic bond, okay? And then atoms of which elements tend to lose electrons? Well, that's metals. Metals tend to lose electrons or give them up, and then nonmetals tend to gain them. So when a chlorine atom, a halogen, gains an electron, it gets a charge of negative one because it's only gaining one electron to reach stability because it has seven valence electrons. It only needs to gain one to reach eight. So if you gain a negative one, then you have a negative charge, and it's also known as an anion, which is the opposite of the sodium. If a sodium gives up an electron, if it gives up a negative charge, then it gets a positive one charge and is known as the cation. So again, the octet rule is that elements tend to combine in such a way that each atom has eight electrons in its outer shell, or two for hydrogen, because remember that first energy level only has space for two electrons, okay? So knowing what we know about metals um, forming bonds with nonmetals being ionic, um, having that be an ionic bond, or that covalent bonds mean that nonmetals are bonding with nonmetals, uh, we can look at each of these molecules and identify whether it's an ionic bond or a covalent bond just by identifying whether or not these are metals or nonmetals. So chlorine and hydrogen are both nonmetals, so that means that that's forming a covalent bond. Aluminum is to the left of the metal metalloid stair step, whereas oxygen is to the right of it. So we have one metal and one nonmetal which form an ionic bond, right? Sodium is a metal and sulfur is a nonmetal, so that's also an ionic bond. Hydrogen and sulfur are both nonmetals, so that forms a covalent bond. Barium and fluoride um, are, barium is a, not, is a metal, I'm sorry. Barium is a metal, fluorine is a nonmetal, so that forms an ionic bond. Nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals, so they form a covalent bond. Carbon and bromine are both nonmetals, so they also form a covalent bond. Magnesium is a non is a metal, and chlorine is a nonmetal, so that forms an ionic bond. <clears throat> Creating H2O. To gain stability, an atom can bond with another atom of the same element. 
or it may bond with an atom of another element. After these bonds form, we often find that the product's chemical and physical traits are very different than the traits of the original reactants. Hydrogen and oxygen have a lot in common. They're gases, and they have no color or odor. They also need to bond with other elements to stabilize their electron structures. In a water molecule, two hydrogen atoms each share their one valence electron with an oxygen atom. The hydrogen atoms both need one more electron to fill their electron level. Meanwhile, the oxygen atom has six valence electrons and needs two more electrons to fill its outermost level. When water forms, all the atoms can fill their valence energy level with the eight shared electrons. When these two elements combine, the end compound, water, looks and acts nothing like its parents. While oxygen and hydrogen are highly reactive, water is chemically inert and a mainstay for all life. This example applies to many compounds which bear no resemblance to the elements that compose them. Chemical reactions not only allow atoms to become stable, but also to produce valuable compounds like water and sugar. All right, so the main takeaway for that video was that parent elements, before they form a bond, will have their own properties, and then after they form their bond can create all new properties. So water in that example is two extremely flammable gases, a hydrogen and oxygen, to, that combine to form water, which is not flammable at all, and has completely unique properties independent of its parent elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Pencil lead is another example. So carbon is combined with clay to make pencil lead, uh, but it also combines, carbon also combines with oxygen and hydrogen to make table sugar. So those molecules have extremely different properties, physical properties. We also have ozone. So if you have two oxygen atoms that bond together, that's diatomic oxygen or just oxygen in the air. Um, if you have three oxygen atoms that bond together, that's called ozone which is completely different than diatomic oxygen, has very different properties. <clears throat> so the homework for tonight is the show what you know, principles of bonding and types of bonds. That's due before class tomorrow. And the honor students um, will find on Schoology a rubric and some background information in order to write a three paragraph response on the ethical use of pseudoephedrine, which is found in most cough syrups. Uh, that's due before class on the test day next Tuesday, and it's also offered as a 20-point extra credit assignment for non-honors. And that is all I have for you today.